going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 is where we're going to be uh, spending most of our time this morning. If you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, there's some Bibles in the pews around you. Feel free to grab one of those and turn to page 1198. You will find Romans chapter 5 in that place. If you don't have a Bible and you need a Bible and you want to read the Word of God, then take one of these with you. We want you to have God's Word and to read it and let it be part of your life. Uh, Next weekend is Halloween, and we're going to be doing some different stuff. Uh, And so I want to mention that as as you're getting ready, uh, uh, finding your texts and things. Uh, On Saturday, we're only going to have one worship service, and it's not going to be in the evening. I know most of you are here on Sunday morning, but sometimes you think about, hey, I can't be there on Sunday, I'll come Saturday. Next Saturday, we don't have our evening services. We're going to have one service at 3 o'clock, and it's going to be followed immediately by a party for the kids, a Halloween jam uh, Julie and her team are putting together this, uh, this great experience out in the parking lot. It's going to be a blast. And we're inviting the kids to come to church dressed up. We're inviting the parents to come to church dressed up. Heck, I'm going to come to church dressed up. So, uh, uh, you know, that's just going to be kind of a, uh, a different day. So if that's something that appeals to you and your family and your kids, we want you to know about that and uh, plan accordingly. The details are in your bulletin. And speaking of change and doing something different, change is inevitable. You guys notice that about life? I mean, change happens. You can't really stop it. The seasons change. I mean, here in Havasu, we've only got two seasons, really. Hot and not hot. So uh, we're all thankful right now that we're in the not hot season. It finally got there. It seemed a little later in coming this year, but we're there. And, and, you know, so the seasons change. The tourists change. You know, during the hot season, we have a lot of people with big boats that drive into town. In the not hot season, we have a lot of people with big motorhomes that drive into town. <laughs> Things change. The world changes. I mean, we've gotten all this cool technology and, and, you know, economies change and businesses change and all that kind of stuff. I mean, there's tension in the Middle East where, you know, tension with Russia. Well, maybe some things don't ever change. But, uh, you know, change happens and we see it most clearly when we look in the mirror. You know, or on our old photos and then in the mirror. Right, Because then we see that our bodies are changing. Uh, six weeks ago, I uh, had the birth of uh, my first grandson. And, and uh, you know, he came out and was like, oh, of course, they're, you have to say they're all beautiful and stuff like that because they're babies. But, you know, he's scrawny. I mean, he's like seven pounds, four ounces. And it's like, all right, just little sticks for arms and legs. It's like, hey, we need some uh, meat on these bones. And six weeks later, he's gained like 50% of his original body weight. You know, he's chunking up, and and he's growing and changing, and he looks different. And the way that God designed it is this. He's going to get bigger and stronger, and he's going to crawl, and he's going to walk, and he's going to run, and he's going to start talking. Eventually, it'll be intelligible. Uh, And and then he'll start school and grow to be a teenager. That's what happens. And uh, and if he lives through the teenage years, then uh, he'll become an adult, an adult, a young adult, in all of their strength and all their health and all of their glory. Do you guys remember what it was like to be 21? Some of you are going, yeah. Some of you are right around there. And so you're like, what? What's the big deal? See, at 21, you're invincible. You can do anything. And the, the world is before you and nothing really hurts all that much. And, uh, and then if you live long enough, you know what you become? Old. That's right. See, if you live long enough, you become old. And everything changes. The body changes. Yeah, you know, little things that you used to not think about now become a, an issue. Like, for instance, when you're young, remember when you learned how to tie your shoe and, and you're just like down there on the floor or on your feet and you bend over and you're just like laying there and your knees and your chin and all that kind of stuff. You're tying your shoe. It doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> right? If I got to tie my shoe now, I'm looking for the right height bench to sit on or chair. So I can bend, or, or, you know, or you put it up on something so you can reach it. Okay. And then you still need oxygen when you're done. Uh, and some of you, let's just be honest, some of you gave up tying your shoes years ago. You just wear slip-on stuff or you just don't tie them. It's like, I don't even have to bend over. I stopped trying to bend over years ago. It just, things change, you know. When you're young, if it hurts, you lie down. When you're old, you lie down. It hurts. <laughs> just, It is. You can't see as well, can't remember anything, can't eat what you used to. Change is part of life. And change is one of Calvary's core values. 
We're doing our series called The Core, um, and we're looking at who we are. We want you to know who we are, understand what makes Calvary tick, our core values, our essential beliefs, the things that are really important to us. We do that because we want you to be informed. If you're checking us out, we want you to know we don't do games here, so we just kind of tell you up front what we're all about. Uh, a few weeks ago, we kicked this off talking about calling, that we are called to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. That is not an option. And then we talked about character, that we cannot represent Jesus unless we reflect his character. Last week, we talked about connection as one of our values, that life change happens in the context of relationships. And we want you to connect to God and to each other as the family of faith and to our community. And today, we're going to talk about change. Change. It is impossible to follow Jesus and stay the same. It's impossible to follow Jesus and stay the same. In Matthew chapter 9, it says, As Jesus passed from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed Jesus. Follow me. Jesus' invitation to his disciples, to the crowds, to you and to me is still the same. It's simply this, follow me. Follow me. Follow me on this incredible, faith-filled journey of discovery. Jesus says, follow me, and and he's telling us, hey, you know the ultimate destination is going to be heaven, but along the way, I'm not going to tell you exactly where you're going to go or what you're going to do. Just know that I'm going to be with you. Sometimes it's going to be great, and sometimes it's going to be tough, but I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you, and I'll give you the strength for the journey. But follow me on this dynamic, exciting adventure of faith. And I was thinking about that. Jesus invites us into this adventure, and somehow church turned that into something that was a lot more boring. Didn't they? Uh, You know, I was thinking, like, what if church was an amusement park, or or following Jesus was an amusement park, and church had kind of become like the merry-go-round? Right? You get on the merry-go-round, and what do you do? You just go in circles. Right? Does anybody else get nauseous on the merry-go-round? Is it just me? Uh, you know, merry-go-round just goes in circles, and, and, and it's boring. You just do the same thing over and over and over again to bad music. <laughs> it's like a lot of churches I've been in. But really, following Jesus is supposed to be like a roller coaster, right? You, you know, you wait for it. You're excited about it. You get on there. There's nervousness. There's, you're, you're scared. You're excited. You're thrilled. And, and then you get up there, and you, you know, the anticipation builds. The next thing you know, it drops, and it turns, and it twists. And you're not sure which way you're going or which way is up. And, you, and, and at the end of it, you're just like out of breath, and you're like, wow. That's what it means to follow Jesus because he he's just says, look, trust me. Trust me, and let's go. So I want you to know that if you're a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then you cannot stay the same. You can't stay the same because Jesus came to change our lives. He came to change our lives. Jesus did not invade our world to make bad people behave. Jesus didn't come into our world to get us to attend church or to be a motivational teacher. Jesus came into this world to change our destiny from hell to heaven. Jesus came into this world to alter our identity so that you and I could become sons and daughters of God. He came to remake our lives completely. And we see this when we read Scripture. If you open up the New Testament, you will read pictures of change. They're just all throughout the Bible. There are these pictures of change. Let me just call your attention to some of the big ones. How about John chapter 3? This guy named Nicodemus, a religious leader, comes to Jesus and he says, Teacher, because he thought he was a motivational teacher. He said, Teacher, what do I have to do to have eternal life? And Jesus said, You must be born again. You have to have this new birth experience. And it confused Nicodemus. He didn't understand that it wasn't good enough just to be born in the line of Abraham. It's not good enough just to be born physically. You have to experience this spiritual life, this change that happens on the inside. That's why we talk about the life-changing relationship with Jesus. You have to be born again. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul says, If anyone... If anyone at all is in Christ, 
They are a new creation. The old passes away. All things become new. A whole new creation. That's what Jesus does. In his letter to uh, the church at Ephesus, the Apostle Paul again said uh, in chapter 2, Once you were dead in your trespasses and sins. And now, because of Jesus, you've been made alive in Christ. Wow, that's a big change. You were dead and now you're alive. Later on in that same uh, book, in chapter 5, he says, Once you were people of darkness, now you are people of light. So walk in the light. Walk in the light. See, Jesus came to change our lives. And the Bible paints these pictures of drastic life change happening. And the Bible also describes the process of change. God tells us what he's going to do in our lives to change us. Now, this is important to know because most of us really don't like change unless it's our idea. Right? I mean, if you think of a change, it's brilliant. But if somebody else comes to you and says, I want you to change your life based on these things, you're like, no, leave me alone. Right? I'm not going to do it. We like change if it's our idea. And, and basically, most of us like change if it happens in other people's lives. Right? We like external change. Um, we we kind of do this because of our sin nature, but this is how we tend to think, right? If, if I want my marriage to be better, if I want to be happier in my marriage, then I, I kind of look at my spouse and I go, you need to change. <laughs> right? If you would start doing this, if you would stop doing this, if you would just change the way that you behave, I would be happy and we would be happy. We look at our kids, we think, I want, a, I want a better family, I want a healthier family. And if my kids would just do what I tell them, if they'd make good grades, and if they would excel in sports or activities, and, and they would clean their room, then I would be happy. If they would change. We think about our work, and we think, well, if the boss would just promote me, and I would get more responsibility, and, or if my employees would work harder and better and be more productive, then I would be happy because I would be successful. We want the world to change around us. And the truth is, if that's your attitude, if that's your expectation of change, the only thing that's going to change is going to be for the worse. That's the the place you're going. It's not going to change for the better. Change has to begin with you. Jesus came to change our lives, not their lives. Our lives. It starts with us personally. I, you know, I tell pastors this every chance I get. I, you know, hang out with pastors a lot, uh, and, uh, and sometimes I'm invited to speak to them, and I really appreciate that because the first thing I tell them is, hey, if you want things to be different, change begins with you. Because pastors, when you put a bunch of them together, they start complaining about their deacons. Their deacons do this. They don't do that. They start complaining about their leaders. They're just not committed. And they complain about their churches. Our church needs to change. And, and I go, great, okay, um, you need to change. If you want different deacons, if you want better leaders, if you want a church that's changing, you need to change. It starts with you. So I don't usually get invited back. Uh, and uh, <laughs> Because we don't want to hear it. But it's true. If you want a better marriage, then you be the better husband, be the better wife. You stop worrying about them changing, and you take care of what you actually have control over. You change your behavior. You want a healthier family? Then you be the mom and dad or grandparent that God called you to be. You you bless and serve your kids and watch how things change. You want a better job or better employees, then you work harder. You be more productive. You be a better leader. And watch what happens. You see, God is going to change our lives, and change begins with us. And he actually tells us how he's changing our lives. If we read Scripture, and we're going to look at Romans chapter 5 now, he actually tells us the process of change that he is using to make you and I the people that he wants us to be. And so since God is blunt that way, we ought to go ahead and listen to what he says, even if we don't like it. I'm going to begin in verse 1. I know your notes say verse 3, but I'm going to begin in verse 1. I want you to hear the lead up to this. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Pause right there. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, right? He says we've been saved because of Jesus, and now we're in God's family. We're not in enmity with God anymore. 
and, and, and we live in this wonderful grace of God, and we hope in heaven, and we rejoice in that hope of heaven. I, I, do you guys rejoice in the hope of heaven? Yeah, I mean, I don't know anybody who's a follower of Christ that doesn't go, yeah, you're right, heaven's going to be good. I know life might be difficult now. Heaven's going to be really good, and we're, we rejoice in that. But Paul goes on. He doesn't stop there. Not only that, not only that, that rejoicing in the hope of heaven, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Suddenly we think Paul's lost his mind. We rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Wow. Here, here's what God wants to do to change our lives. First of all, he wants us to rejoice in the fact that he's working in our lives. He wants us to have an attitude that says, God, I am thankful and I am happy. I'm excited that you are working in my life. And, and then he says, when you encounter suffering and pain, understand that your response is to have a good attitude so that you can endure. Endure. What does it mean to endure? It means that you don't give up because you believe that God is true. You don't give up because you believe that God is real and he's going to stick with you and his promises are going to apply to your life. So you don't quit. And what happens is when you endure then God begins to build your character. He etches the character of Christ on your soul. You become a different person because the Holy Spirit who's in you begins to develop you to look like Jesus on the inside. And as that character is developed, what happens is that hope begins to well up in your life. The hope that gives you that assurance that God really is true and he's not going to give up on you and that you can live according to his promises, not just your fears. And that hope begins to well up and change your life so that you actually can rejoice always. Again, I'll say it, rejoice. And that hope begins to overflow onto other people and other people are drawn to you because you have this hope in Christ that nothing in this world can extinguish. And they begin to come to Jesus because of the hope that you are living out in your life. That's the process that God is using to change me and you. So do you want a life that is marked by character and hope? So do you want a life that's marked by character and hope? Okay, well, if, you know, if not, just, stay on the, just ignore Paul and stay on the path that you're on. But if you want that life, then rejoice in the adversity. That's not something that comes natural. You have to choose to do it. You have to learn to do it. Rejoice when, you, when you're facing struggles, when the pain comes your way. Knowing that God isn't causing the pain, God is redeeming the pain. And he's using those struggles to change our lives forever. You see, God is committed to changing our lives. Are we committed to embracing the change? I already said our default position is we don't like change unless it's our idea. This is God's idea. Are we going to partner with God in his work to change us? Or are we going to resist God at that work to change us? Or are we just going to complain about God and his work to change us? Pretty much your only choices. You can partner with God and say, okay, God, I don't like the pain, but I know you're working in my life, so I'm going to rejoice in this, and I'm going to hang on so that you can build the character and that results in hope. Or are you going to resist and say, nope, it's not my idea. I'm not going to do it. I don't like it. I'm going to fight against it. Or are you just going to complain about it? Because we all love hanging around complainers, right? Yeah. Why me? It's not fair. How come this has to happen to me? I don't like it. It's not, you know, why, why is it always me? No, it's not always you. It's God working in you. So how does God want to change your life? Can you look at your life and see how he's developing you right now? Because if you can, it makes it a whole lot easier to rejoice in the change. Are you embracing the change? Are you resisting the change? Are you complaining about the change? Because Jesus came to change our lives. And Jesus sends us to change the world. He sends us to change the world. Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, the the final words of Jesus recorded in the book of Matthew to his followers were these. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. And lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. It's what's known as the Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations. Kind of seems like a daunting task, doesn't it? Go and change the world. Jesus sends us. The world's a big place. I mean, even Havasu, our small little city is a big place. 50,000 plus people live here. As best we can figure out, about 40,000 of them are unchurched. And, and we're sent to change the world. Man, how do, we, how do we even wrap our heads around that? Two important thoughts I want to share with you today. First of all, we serve God acts. We serve God acts. God is the change agent. We are the conduit for him to work through. Do you get that picture in your mind? It's not us that makes the change happen. We're the conduit that God brings change through. So we serve our community. By the way, Main Street, Saturday night, if you want to help us bless families, pass out candy, have a blast uh, playing games with kids, then sign up at the table on your way out. We'll, We'll empower you to serve our community and to bless people in the process in Jesus' name. Uh, So we serve our community, and God acts to change lives. We offer assistance to the hurting, and God acts to change lives. We bless families at weddings and funerals, and God acts to change lives. We send missionaries all over the world, and God acts to change lives. You see, we share the good news that Jesus has changed our lives, and because of that, we believe that he can change their life too. Isn't that what we believe? God changed me. He can, he can give you the same forgiveness, the same hope, the same life change that I experienced. But the results, the power to change a life is completely in God's hands. Now, I don't know about you, but that takes a lot of the pressure off. Because I grew up in the kind of churches where the pressure was, you got to do something, you got to make it happen. And, and there was a lot of times there was manipulation and pressure, kind of that, that sales, you know, you got to decide now, today, right in this moment, come down this aisle, do it, do it. Do, you know, and and, and I, I didn't thrive in that. I, I confess, there were times I tried that approach with people and I felt horrible doing it. We don't need to do that. We need to be faithful servants of God and allow God to act through us. We serve and God acts. The results, the power to change a life is in God's hands. Now, we understand that truth, but we also change the world one person at a time. We change the world one person at a time. God doesn't expect you to go win thousands of strangers to Christ. I mean, if he's called you to be that missionary in that place where people, nobody knows Jesus, it might happen. If you go on a mission trip and you have a great evangelistic opportunity, it might happen. But, but here's the thing, uh, it rarely happens where one of us would impact thousands of people through our, our opportunity just to share the gospel in one moment. So God doesn't expect that of you. If he allows you to do that, then rejoice in that because that's really cool. But he does expect you to influence your family and your friends with the good news of Jesus. Now, I think that's a reasonable expectation that he has on every person who's a follower of Christ. This is a powerful way that God uses each of us to change the world. Because your family and your friends trust you and they will listen to you if you live a credible changed life in front of them. Um, here's how it works. Uh, I heard this story recently, and I asked permission to share it. I got permission, uh, but uh, the, the woman who shared it with me didn't want her name used. So I'll just refer to her as my friend, okay? She, my friend came to Calvary about seven years ago, and her faith came alive when she got here. God changed her. She got excited. Her first point of influence was her husband. She brought him. God changed his life, uh, and, and, and they're servants of Christ uh, through Calvary's ministry here. And she immediately began uh, trying to influence her, her adult children, uh, make a difference in their life, had some success there. And, and she started you know, sharing with her, her sister. And her sister was just like, nope, don't tell me about that stuff. I don't want to listen to that stuff. I don't want you to share scripture with me. Don't tell me to listen to Christian music. I don't want any of that stuff. Just, just leave me alone. And, and over seven years, she was encouraging, and she'd post stuff, and she'd share stuff. And her sister was just like, I don't want to hear it. But her sister's daughter, her niece, uh, began to dialogue a little bit with her about that. And, and, uh, and when my friend mentioned something about women of faith, uh, her niece said, I'd go to that with you. 
So my friend immediately said, okay, I'll buy tickets for you and my daughter, and, and we'll go together because there's one near your home, and uh, we'll fly up to you and, and take you to Women of Faith. Well, then her sister got upset. What do you mean you're going to take my daughter to that, you know, cult thing? Uh, and, and so, uh, because let's, let's be honest about it. If you're not on the inside and you're watching it from the outside, that could be kind of a scary kind of, you know, thing to watch all these thousands of people go and, and, and just be weird together. So, uh, <laughs> Let's just be honest, if, if, you're, if you don't know what worship looks like, then that's, that's kind of how it feels. So she said, well, I'm, I'm not going to let you take her without me. And, yeah. and, and But, you know, when, when you're kind of nervous about being around all those Christians and stuff, then you don't just go alone. So she t- brought like six of her friends with her. So now there's nine of them that are going to Women of Faith. And, uh, and so my friend and her daughter fly up there, and they get together with uh, her sister and her niece and, and their friends, and, and, and they go, and she's telling me her sister's, like, really nervous that, you know, first day. What's it going to be like? And are people going to bother us? And they going to harass us? And they can do weird things to us? And, you know, and she's just really, you know, just really nervous. By the end of the conference... She was worshiping, she was praising God, her faith had come alive, she's buying all the Christian music CDs and speaking CDs and giving them to people. God changed her life seven years in the process in that working because my friend understood that God changes the world one person at a time. He wants to use you that same way. Who is that person that you are praying for God to change? Who, who is that, that person that you want to be the change agent in their life, that conduit that God's grace flows through to them so that God can make a difference eternally in them? Because Jesus came to change our lives, and he sends us to change the world, one person at a time. Finally, I want you to know today that Calvary celebrates change. We celebrate change. This is a celebration place, in case you've missed it. Uh, We celebrate uh, life change. We celebrate baptism. We love it when when people declare their faith in Jesus Christ. We celebrate recovery, right? Anyone here? uh, We celebrate the reconciliation of families, of healing, of answers to prayer. We celebrate God's freedom and His grace and His power in our lives. We celebrate the reality of heaven as our future. We celebrate change. And in a couple of months, we're going to be celebrating a new worship facility on our Sweetwater campus. Yeah, something to celebrate, isn't it? See, that's going to be big change. Are you ready for it? See, there's a lot of excitement, but uh, there's going to be changes that are going to be uh, like really cool and some that you're going to go like, wait, I didn't know about that. So, uh, again, when we change, lots of stuff's going to change. Like, for instance, we're going to go from having one campus to two campuses. We're going to have the McCulloch campus, where you are right now, and we're going to have the Sweetwater campus over on Sweetwater. Yeah, thanks. Thought you'd catch that. And, and, and here's the thing. All the weekend services are going to move over to Sweetwater. But our offices are going to remain here at McCulloch. And... and Calvary Christian Academy is going to remain here at McCulloch, and Celebrate Recovery is going to be here at McCulloch, and a lot of weddings and funerals will be here at McCulloch. And and you'll have to actually look at your bulletin and read which campus your time is meeting on. Yeah, see? (laughs) And what's going to happen? I promise you this is what's going to happen. You're going to show up at the wrong campus sometime, and you're going to see the parking lot's empty and go, oh, rats. Good news is it's only three minutes away, Right? That's if you have to wait for the lights. So, you know, that's a change. Now, we get to Sweetwater Campus. There's going to be more parking. Yay. There's going to be, yeah, I know, people are going, yeah, I'm looking forward to more parking. There's going to be more seating. There's going to be more people. It's still going to be crowded, I pray. (laughs) Hey, new entrances, new child check-in, different seating. Some of you are going to have like this real struggle because you're going to walk in and go, where's my seat? I don't know, and, and, and it's going to be different, and it's going to have a different feel and a different look, and some of you are going to lo- love it, and some of you aren't. Some of you are going to find yourselves going, oh, but I liked McCulloch Campus better. You really will. Let's just be honest about that. Uh, we're going to upgrade children's ministry at, at Sweetwater Campus. You, you know, we've built the building pretty much for worship and for kids. And because of that, we're going to upgrade children's ministry. There's going to be changes, and some of you are going to love those changes, and some of you are going to go, but I like the way you used to do it. 
Please understand, we don't make changes based on preferences or convenience. We make changes to help lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus through the love of his people and the power of his truth. That's what it's all about. And, and, and the mission never changes. And, and our core values and our essential beliefs are consistent. But Jesus came to change our lives. And he sent us to change the world. Are you going to join with us in celebrating change? Or are you going to resist the changes that God wants to make in your life? Choice is yours. But God has already made his choice. He wants to change us completely. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us so much that you were not willing to leave us in our sin. But you changed our destiny through the sacrifice of Jesus. And today we rejoice in that. And Father, today our prayer is this, that we would hear your voice. We would sense your presence. We'd know your love personally. And we would embrace the change that you want to make in our lives in our church, in this community. So God, we commit ourselves to you in the name of the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ. Amen.